Actually, today I wanted to share with you about the topic of forgiveness. And this is a topic that I shared with actually about two weeks ago at our uh, CNU Tuesday night Bible study. And as I was preparing this week, really in my heart, I really felt like God wanted me to share this same message with all of you as well. And I believe there, there are many of you in this room who will be blessed uh, by this topic and by this message from God. Uh, let's read together Luke chapter 17, verse 3 and 4. Let's read it together. Let's begin. I am warning you, if another believer sins, rebuke him. Then if he repents, forgive him. Even if he wrongs you seven times a day, and each time turns again and asks for forgiveness, forgive him. Obviously, you know that this is, uh, today's topic is about forgiveness. And again, the reason why I want to share this message with you is because I really believe God wants to speak to us this week about this message. I was praying throughout the week. I said, God, what do you want me to share with you? And in my heart, God kept laying an impression in my heart about this topic. Some people say that this topic of forgiveness is the key to every marriage, every relationship. Some say that this is a key to a lasting peace and love. Forgiveness is that key. Before I start, I want to share with you some interesting quotes that I found on the topic of forgiveness. Mahatma Gandhi, he said, a weak can never forgive. Forgiveness is the attitude of the strong. Sherry Carter Scott, anger makes you smaller while forgiveness forces you to grow beyond what you are. Alexander Pope, to err is human, to forgive is divine. Robert Quinlan, a happy marriage is the union of two good forgivers. Reinhold Neighbor, forgiveness is the final form of love. And Lance Morrow, not to forgive is to be imprisoned by the past, by old grievances that do not permit life to proceed with new business. Not to forgive is to yield oneself to another's control, to be locked into a sequence of act and response, of outrage and revenge, tis for tat, escalating always. The present is endlessly overwhelmed and devoured by the past. Forgiveness frees the forgiver. It extracts the forgiver from someone else's nightmare. In this passage in the Bible, there's an interesting example about forgiveness in Peter's life. And it's mentioned in Matthew chapter 18, verse 21 and 22. Let me share this with you. Here, Peter approaches Jesus. He says, Then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? No, Jesus answered, 77 times. Here, Jesus, here, Peter asked Jesus how many times we should forgive someone. And the interesting fact about this verse is the number seven. Why in the world did Peter come up, where in the world did Peter come up with the number seven? Why of all the numbers, it could be 10, 20, 30, it could be one. Why did Peter come up with a number seven? And there are various, you know, uh, guess as to why he picked the seven. But in my opinion, I think the reason why Peter picked the number seven was, in his mind, I think he wanted to be very generous. Because he knew that forgiveness was a good thing. But how often, how many times should we forgive? So before he approached Jesus, he thought to himself, okay, I'm going to come up with maybe a good, reasonable number. And I believe Peter probably thought seven is a good, reasonable number, of generous number. You know, if you really think about it, how many times do you really forgive someone? And I don't think Peter was talking about forgiving the minor sins or minor mistakes. Like when someone shows up late, oh, why are you late? Okay, I forgive you. I don't think Peter is talking about that. I don't think Peter is talking about someone, you know, maybe cutting in line and so forth. And like, oh, he cut in my line. Oh, okay, I'll forgive you. Man, you farted. How dare you fart in my presence? Okay, I forgive you. I don't think Peter is talking about those minor offenses. I think what Peter was wondering was, how many times do we forgive someone for major offense? Something that really hurt us deeply. The reason I say that is because if Peter was talking about minor offenses, if somebody maybe burps in front of you, maybe somebody, you know, spills something in front of you, or maybe somebody, you know, like I said, being late, 
there's no way Peter would have chosen the number seven. He would have probably chosen maybe 70 or 100 or 200. The reason why Peter chose seven was because what Peter was talking about is how often do we forgive someone for really hurting us deeply, scarring us. And in his mind, seven was a generous number. About the only relationship that I can think of where we, can, we really have to forgive someone more than seven times, possibly, is in a relationship, in a marital relationship. That's the only relationship that I can think of where we have to forgive someone maybe more than seven times. But in every other relationship, as friends, as coworkers, as you know, people that you know, we, you know, we see often, we don't really forgive them more than seven times. At best, maybe once or twice. If really, really somebody's bad, maybe you forgive them three or four times in the workplace. So Peter is approaching Jesus, and he's wondering, how often should we forgive someone for really hurting us? And Jesus gives us gives a very interesting answer to Peter. Again, he says, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? No, Jesus replied. Seventy times seven. You know, for those of you who can do math really fast, what is, what is 70 times seven? Yeah, just as I thought. Go back to school. No, 400, 490 times. Now, is Jesus really saying that we need to forgive someone 490 times? No. Jesus was trying to say, you say seven, but you know what? Multiply that by seven, not just seven, 70. The point that Jesus is trying to make is that, you know, the number of times we should forgive someone is unlimited. It should be something that's ingrained in our lives. How often should we forgive someone? There's no number. It's exponentially greater than what you can imagine. But the question that I want to ask you is this. Why is Jesus so emphatic about forgiveness? Why is Jesus so passionate as to say, hey, it's not seven times. It's 70 times seven. It is because without forgiveness, we ourselves, number one, can never truly experience God's love and the fellowship of believers. We cannot experience God's forgiveness unless we learn to practice forgiveness ourselves. Mark chapter 11, verse 25 and 26 states, But when you are praying, first forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against, so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. There are many ways to look at this, but one of the ways that we, we can clearly see is that we cannot truly experience and understand the forgiveness of God unless we practice and experience forgiving others. Let me say this again. We cannot truly experience the magnitude, the greatness, the awesomeness of God's forgiveness in our lives unless we learn to forgive others. The examples are simple. You know, what I hear is that Indian curry is really spicy and delicious. You know, I've never tasted Indian curry. I don't know, maybe. I thought it was Indian curry, but some of our Indian brothers kept saying that, oh, no, this is not Indian curry. It's too, it's too mild. Indian curry is really, really spicy. You know, because I've never tasted Indian curry, there's no way I can go up to anyone else and say, oh, you should try Indian curry. It is the best curry in the entire world. Oh, it is so delicious. I can never say or express with that kind of passion about Indian curry. Why? I've never tasted it. You know, God's forgiveness in our lives is one of the most powerful things that we can ever experience. God's forgiveness, the extent of his love. And the Bible tells us that we, unless we ourselves practice forgiveness in the lives of others, we will never fully experience his forgiveness in our lives. And that is why Jesus is so emphatic about, you know what, we, you need to forgive. Because unless you learn to forgive, you will never truly appreciate my forgiveness in your lives. Secondly, forgiveness is necessary for our fellowship and community. 
In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5 through 11, let me just read you one verse. It says, Now it is time to forgive him and comfort him. Otherwise, he may become so discouraged that he won't be able to recover. Now show him that you still love him. You see, when we forgive someone, what we don't realize is that we are releasing that person of guilt. We're releasing that person from the life of guilt. We are restoring the fellowship. We're building the community of believers. Years ago, I was invited to speak at a church as a guest speaker. It was a small, young church. It was about four years old, not really that young. It was a four-year-old church. And the pastor there invited me to come and speak. And I, I went there and I spoke. And the, and the church congregation was about 25 to 30 members. It was a very, very small group, which really doesn't bother me. It is always a privilege and honor for me to speak God's word. But as I went and as I spoke and as I met different members, something really odd, uh, something was really at odd. And what was at odd? What was the odd thing was that the church was four years old and it was still 25 people. And perhaps I thought maybe he's the pastor. Maybe he's not a good speaker. Maybe he's not really a good leader. But the more I spoke to him, I realized he was really a good man, a good leader. And then I looked at the congregation. I thought maybe there's something wrong with the congregation. Maybe it was filled with a bunch of losers. Then the more I got to know the congregation, the more time I spent with them, these were really wonderful men and women of God. They were nice people. They were respectful, well-educated, polite faithful and I was wondering why is it that this church wasn't growing and during one evening during dinner time one of the church members house I think I discovered the answer from one of the church members mother she inadvertently mentioned about another church member and an argument that this person had with another church member within what had happened was that Years ago, a couple of years back, a, a new member came, a new visitor came. And apparently, he was a troublemaker. Apparently, he had lots of past. He did a lot of bad things, and he had bad relationship with a lot of people. And that, was, and, and, and that wasn't the issue. But what happened was that the, the pastor of that church took a liking to him. He liked him. So after a few months, he lifted him up and appointed him as one of the leaders of the church. And apparently, there was another old church member when he found out that the pastor appointed this new one, new guy, who had this history of doing terrible things as a church leader, he took offense to that. And then he started telling other people about how he displeased he was about how the senior pastor appointing this guy as one of the leaders. And when that news got out to this new member, that this old member was criticizing him, well, one day I heard that they got into a real heated argument, and, and not a physical fight, but really heated this argument. And what I've discovered was that for two years that these two men have not spoken to each other. You see, when there is no forgiveness, there is no community. Without forgiveness, there cannot be fellowship. And I realized that one of the reasons what destroyed this church or prevented this church from growing was the lack of forgiveness. You see, Jesus loves the church. Jesus died for the church so the church could grow, the church can expand, so, so that God's glory will be revealed to all the world. But he knew that unless that we learn to forgive one another, and unless we, unless forgiveness was part of our lives, he knew the church could never grow. See, we need to learn to forgive. Lastly, because unless we learn to forgive, we also become prisoners of that unforgiving, unforgiveness. See, Jesus was emphatic about forgiveness. Because number one, Jesus wanted us to truly experience his forgiveness as we forgive others. Jesus wanted us to forgive because without forgiveness, there is no community. And there cannot be fellowship. And the church cannot grow. But lastly, Jesus wanted us to forgive because unless we forgive, we ourselves become prisoner of that unforgiveness. Years ago, 
when I was a really a young pastor. I was about 26 years old. And I remember I was at a church parking lot. And I was around a bunch of church members, and they were all older gentlemen, probably in their late 40s or early 50s and, and so forth. And we were talking, and they were talking, and I kind of went there as a, you know, I wasn't, I was working with the youth. I was working with young people, so, you know, I didn't know them well. But as I was walking by, they were talking about guns. They were talking about gun control. And, you know, whether you agree with me or not, my belief is that we need to have gun control in America. Uh, I think, again, I don't want to get political, but that's my personal view. Uh, I think there should be some sort of control. And I, I think we have too little control in America when it comes to gun. And I just kind of, for me, I wasn't really thinking, and I was just kind of, I went there and I said, you know what, yeah, I think, we, I believe in gun control. I think we should have more. And all of a sudden, as soon as I mentioned that, one of the older gentlemen turned to me, and I, 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 can't, I will not forget his, his, the look. His eye became just enraged, and he just stared me down, leaning forward. He says, have you ever had somebody point a gun at you? Well, I have experienced it, and there's no way I will ever let someone point a gun at me. If someone ever points a gun at me again, I will. And then he stopped. I can pretty much finish that sentence. So can you. I think he wanted to say, if somebody ever pointed a gun at me, I am going to shoot him. And throughout the day, you know, I could not forget that image, the look of anger. I mean, just hatred and anger in this man's face. You know, I've never had someone point a gun at me and threaten me. So in that sense, I don't really understand the magnitude of the trauma that this man probably experienced. I'm sure it was very traumatic. But what I do understand and what I did see that day was a man who was engulfed with anger that is kept in prison for years and years. You see, the reason why Jesus said we need to forgive, really there are many reasons, but I believe the most important reason, I think, was because it was because of us. Jesus didn't want us to live our lives as a prisoner of unforgiveness. And unless we learn to forgive, we'll be reminded that anger and the bitterness will continue to stay and linger in our lives. But oftentimes when I talk about forgiveness, when I, talk, when I listen, to be honest, with other pastors and other people talk about forgiveness, one of the things that people neglect to mention is, how do we forgive? Every one of us in this room, you know that forgiveness is a good thing. But what I've realized over the years is that not a lot of people really know how to forgive. We think that forgiveness is simply a verbal expression of saying, okay, I forgive you, I forgive you. Only if it were that simple. It's not. There are two important things that, I, that we need to understand when it comes to forgiveness. Number one, forgiveness is a process. It is not a one-time event. Too often when I listen to people, they think forgiveness is a, you know, just say you're sorry, say you're sorry, and it's all forgiven. That's just not true. For those of you who's gone through this, for those of you who's, who's experienced where someone hurt us, that's just not the case. It's not a one-time deal. And for us to say that, and for us to counsel that, and for us to teach that, we're really putting people in a very uncomfortable situation, thinking, what am I doing wrong? Because I've forgiven someone, but it's not going away. The anger is not going away. The bitterness is not going away. So one of the things that we need to understand is that forgiveness is a start. It's a process, but it's only a beginning. Too often we think that forgiveness, we understand it to be as something like an absence of anger. Then it will lead to peace. Again, that's just not true. Absence of anger does not lead to peace. It may lead to peace for that short amount of time, but unless eventually that space where the anger, you know, your, the anger has its place in us, and, and, you know, we say we forgive them, and we try to remove that anger. But unless we replace that space with something else, guess what? Eventually that anger is going to come back. 
You see, absence of peace does not lead, I mean, absence, absence of anger does not lead to peace. What brings peace is presence of love. And that same thing applies when it comes to forgiveness. When we forgive someone that really hurt us, there's a sense of betrayal, the sense of bitterness, hurt, and pain that we experience. And we're trying to let that go. And we say, I forgive that person. We're doing our best to remove that and, and just cast it out. But that, that in itself is not enough because eventually, if we do not fill that void with something else, it's going to come back, that anger and bitterness and pain. You see, forgiveness is a start. It is a process. We forgive, but it takes time to forget. So when we forgive someone, number one, it takes time. You know, the Bible says only God forgives and he forgets. But we're not God. We're not that perfect. So when we forgive someone, we need to understand that it takes time. It's a process. But the second principle that we need to understand is that forgiveness is not just verbal. It is not verbal expression of letting it go. That's just the start. But we need to fill that void of bitterness and anger with love. See, those are the two important principles about forgiveness that we need to understand. Even just from my own experience, a long time ago, at a church, there was this person that said something bad about me. Can you believe that? How can anyone say something bad about me? I am a perfect person. I'm so likable. I'm joking. But there was this person that didn't, I guess, like me too much and he said something bad about me but here's the worst part he said something that was not true it was a lie and he told it to other people and what really really hurt me was some of the people that didn't know me well believed that and I'm not going to go into exactly what he said but let me just say that what this person said was very very hurtful to the point Again, for those of you that know me, I'm not a violent person. I'm not. I get angry, but I don't get violent. But there was one of few moments in my life I actually wanted to become violent and get physical with this person. Only it was through the counsel of another pastor that prevented me from really confronting this man. I mean, I was so angry. My heart would feel so much bitterness and anger. But being a Christian, we all know that forgiveness is the right thing to do. Whenever I pray, God always told me, Paul, you need to forgive him. You need to forgive him. So oftentimes I would go and I would pray. I would get up in the morning. And I would, you know, for the first, like, few weeks, I was just so engulfed with anger and rage that I had to pray every day just to cool that anger and bitterness. And every morning I would pray. I would open the Bible. I would pray. I say, God, I forgive him. I forgive him. And usually, to be honest, when I pray first few times, few days, it didn't help. Then after about two weeks, when my anger kind of settled a little bit, when I prayed, it helped a little bit. But you know what? Only a little bit. After about, you know, a day or two, you know, something would happen. I would see something. I would hear something. They would remind me of this person, and immediately the anger and bitterness and rage would return. And I had to pray again and again. And this was a never-ending cycle for a few months. And that's how bad this, what this person did, what he said was, you know, it was that bad. And only after about two years, I was still praying for this man because that anger and bitterness did not leave me. I mean, it was better because time has passed, and, and that bitterness and anger kind of subsided. But time to time, it still came. And one day, as I was praying, again, after about two years, I was praying for this man. In prayer, God revealed to me this truth. The forgiveness was not simply a verbal expression of saying, I forgive you. He said, Paul, that is only the process, a beginning, a start. He said, Paul, real forgiveness 
is a presence of love. Real, pre real forgiveness can only exist when you love him, when love is present. In other words, what God was telling me was, if you really want to forgive him, you must love him. Not just forgive him in your heart, but you must express. Feel that bitterness, feel that, feel that hatred with love. I think, I may, I may be biased when I say this, but in my relationship with this man, I would say 90% was his fault. And I didn't do anything to deserve what he did to me. Zero. I didn't, in my opinion. But on that day, after prayer, I went to my computer and I wrote a long email. See, I never wanted to talk to him. I didn't want to think about him. I wanted to completely erase the image of this person that hurt me so deeply. But on that day, I went to the computer and I began to write my email. And on the email, I did not say, I forgive you. On that day, on the email, I emailed him and I said, I thank you for all the good things that you did for me. Despite our argument, I know you're a good man. And despite our differences, I know that you've done many good things, not only to me, but to others. But in the end, lastly, I told, on my email, I said, will you forgive me for any wrongs that I've done for you? You see, the reason why I wrote that type of email was, number one, I wanted to release him of any guilt he might have had from the argument that we had or the things that he did. And secondly, the reason why I said those things was because I knew that the only way for me to truly overcome this anger and bitterness was not just for me to simply forgive with words, but I had to forgive him with love. And by telling him, will you forgive me, was my expression of love to him. You know, I wish I could tell you that, you know, that was something that I knew was going to happen. I knew it was going to turn out that way, that God told me this is exactly how it's going to be done. It wasn't the case. In my heart, I felt that's what God was leading me to do, and I did it. And let me tell you something. Once I wrote that letter, and once I pressed that send, click that send icon, this anger and bitterness that, was, that engulfed me for two years, just immediately at that moment, I felt it was being released. Let me just tell you this. Even though I wrote that type of letter, and my letter was long, it was about one full page, and I said a lot of nice things. Let me just tell you this. That man still hadn't replied to me. Not, not, not a simple letter of, I appreciate it, okay, let's move on. Not a, not a simple response of, you know what, I'm sorry too. None of those things. Even till this day, he has not replied. But you know, what's, you know what's so amazing? I no longer get anger. I no longer feel bitter or anger toward this man. In the past, whenever I would see something about America about, that reminded me of him, immediately would, that emotion would come back, but it doesn't anymore. I have this great sense of peace and forgiveness in my heart. Because now, there, in my heart, there is no more room for anger. There is no more room for bitterness. There is no more room for hatred because I fill that void with love. And you know, to be honest with you, it's really hard for me to explain how all these things work, except to say that when I truly forgive them and love them, I was no longer, I was now freed from the bondage of unforgiveness. See, too often we know, you know, people say, people say, you know, you need to forgive, you need to forgive, but I don't think we really know how to forgive. So forgiveness, to really, to recovery, takes time, and it is a process. Maybe for some of you, it'll take more than just one or two acts. Maybe it'll take maybe three or four. But that is what forgiveness is. And that is why forgiveness is so important to Jesus. Because he knew that it was so important to us for, for us to live a life 
free from anger, bitterness, and hatred. I want to close this message with, with this one story. It's a true story. It's a powerful story that really reflects the power of forgiveness. During World War II in France, a young nun, a young nun, was returning to her convent from the market. A soldier on a motorcycle saw her and pulled over. She thought that he stopped to help her with her heavy basket of food, but she soon found out otherwise. This German soldier forced her into the woods. She screamed no one heard her. The trauma that occurred on that day haunted her with nightmares, she says, for years and years and years. But she said that as time went by, gradually, she began to experience healing in her hearts. But then years later, she was for some reason chosen to host a meeting of German teachers as a gesture of post-war reconciliation. In other words, the German government invited her, a French woman, to speak and teach to German teachers to symbolize peace and unity among the two nations. And as she was about to give her lecture, she surveyed the crowd. And in that crowd, among them, sat her aggressor, the man that attacked her and raped her. And at that moment, instantaneously, she said, it all came back. The bitterness, the anger, the thoughts of revenge were unbearable until she spent the night in prayer. And during that night, she said, she cried to God. She cried out to God throughout the night. And in that prayer, she found strength to serve, serve these teachers, serve them all. She ended up finishing that conference. She did not confront him, but she served him. And she said he was only then, she said she was finally freed from her anger, freed from her hatred freed from the unforgiveness. Peter went to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me, who hurts me, who violates me? Seven times? No, Jesus replied. Seventy times seven. Let us pray.